This is the first episode of the Coding and Flow podcast, where I, Florian Walter, will interview interesting people from the programming industry and hopefully ask them interesting questions. This will be a video podcast here on YouTube, but my plan is to also strip the audio out of this and upload it as an as a real audio podcast to a podcast host. So you can listen to this on your favorite podcast player while you are at the gym washing the dishes or doing whatever. My first interview is with none less than Philip Lackner, who many of you know from his Instagram account, Philip Lackner Official, where he has over 100,000 followers and where he shares bite-sized, helpful programming tips. He also has a fast-growing YouTube channel where he uh, posts programming tutorials, mainly Android. Since recently, he started live streaming on Stretch, where you can watch him build a real app from scratch. And of course, I will put links to all of these different accounts into the show notes here on YouTube. This will be on the description under the video. Philip is only 23 years old, but already has 10 years of programming experience. He studied computer science in university. He is self-employed by selling his own courses and he also does some freelancing from time to time. And in his free time, he likes hitting the gym and eating peanut butter. Since we both live in Germany, we have already met in person two times and it always was a lot of fun. And in this episode, he will share his tips on growing on Instagram, finding freelance clients, how he learns new stuff. He will share his opinion and experience with Jetpack Compose, Flutter, Kotlin Multiplatform, and much more. So lean back and enjoy this interview. Okay, so Philip, my uh, first and most important question to you is how to create a Facebook clone using Java? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, for the people who don't know, this is basically a, a meme because as content creators, this is the kind of questions we always get on social media where you don't know what to answer. But it was just a joke. Um, I thought we can start off this episode with you saying a few words about your personal life. What are your hobbies? Maybe you can tell us why you started programming and what do you like about programming? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Philip and I'm uh, 23 years old. I just finished my uh, university, so I got my degree in computer science. And now I am just working. I'm self-employed. I do content. I create content on uh, Instagram, on YouTube. I do regular Android tutorials and programming advice there. And yeah, I sell courses. That is how I basically pay my bills. I started programming quite early when I was 13 years old. And how did I get into that? I, yeah, I got a book from my mom about C++ and I was always quite interested in computer stuff. She knew that, so she, she gave me that book and I just tried it out. I did a lot of stupid things back then, but it actually, it, it caught my interest. And from then on, I actually continued learning more languages and more frameworks. I was into game development, um, also into Java for a while. And then I eventually decided to also study this and also to, yeah, just do stuff to make a living with that now. Yeah, very nice. So props to your mom for bringing you into programming. <laughs> Without her, we wouldn't have your post today. Absolutely. Thanks, and yeah, you, yeah, you already <laughs> mentioned that you uh, create content on Instagram, which was my uh, second question. Why did you decide to uh, start posting stuff on Instagram and other social media accounts? And maybe then we can also uh, talk about some tips for growing on Instagram. Just a few, uh, maybe someone else wants to do the same. So yeah, why did you start creating content on Instagram? Uh, so, so back then, that was now about two years ago when I started that. I had a friend who actually had an Instagram page that was about recycling trash and stuff like that. So not related to programming, but that didn't matter. I just liked the way he did that. So he used a software called Canva for that. That's a website where you can easily create such, such posts by dragging and dropping. And I liked that. That looked a lot of fun. And after a while, I thought, why don't I just do something similar with a topic that I'm actually interested in? At that time, I was getting into Android. Um, back then I was still using Java and I actually only had like two or three weeks of Android experience or rather where 
two or three weeks um, in which I decided to dive deeper into that topic. And that was also the reason why I made that Instagram page. I just wanted to put out content because it's fun. I wanted to just take people with me on the on my journey, how I learned this, and just also be able to, to help people with the content I post. I, I didn't have any real intentions of earning money with that. It was just trying it out um, and just getting my name out there a little bit. Even that wasn't the intention back then, but um, that emerged out of that. So yeah, back then I was also called Android Devs for, for those who still know that. I so remember. I, yeah, I, I wasn't known with my name like today, but eventually I, I changed it because that was also a part of my goal to actually also show myself because I think this, this personal connection also helps people to better understand such concepts. Yeah, it's, uh, the story is actually pretty similar for both of us. I also started making content very early after I started with Android. So yeah, for other people who want to do the same, there's no reason to wait. You don't need to be very experienced to start. There's always something you can share. Um, okay, you mentioned Canva. Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice tool for people who don't know or who don't want to learn a complicated tool like Photoshop because Canva is very easy to get started. For creating content, you can basically drag and drop some text and images and you get nice graphics, right? And they have some templates for that. I used it a few times and it's really nice, especially for Instagram. Um, okay, so if people want to start their own Instagram pages, do you have some tips on how to grow there? Yeah, I have a lot of tips. On the one hand, I would start... Um, don't forget that it's called social media. It's it's not called solo media. So you you have to interact with people. That is the intention of social media platforms. Um, post stories, ask people questions about whatever. So that just encourage them to interact with you. You can um, you should answer every single comment, especially in the beginning. If you grow, that's not always possible. If you also have other priorities, but uh, yeah, especially if you're a small creator, you can always reply to every message, every comment you get. And the smaller you are, the more important it is for you to um, give people detailed answers about their, their projects, because that is how they will um, tell their friends, hey, this is a really nice page uh, and a really nice creator who really helped me with my problems. Another thing that I would say is, listen to feedback and that is it's it, it sounds so obvious but i see people on instagram so often that who basically have so many posts all posts look the same and all posts look pretty bad and they often also ask me for feedback i usually give that but then they say they don't want to change their style because they they have their fixed theming and they think that destroys their feed but I think you should you should start being self-critical. You should look at your content and also kind of check what other creators who maybe have more followers than you, what they do differently and take that as an approach to learn, improve your content. Your, your content will never be perfect. My content is not perfect. Um, but if you always have that that drive to, to become better, then that will also reflect in your, in your follower account. And one, one more thing, that is basically, yeah, that's a strong one. It's just brainstorming, sitting down for an hour and brainstorming what you can do better. And yeah, as I said, you can take a look at other pages and analyze them, but you can also analyze what works for you. You have these insights on Instagram, how many likes, which posts got, how many comments and stuff like that. Just check what people, what people actually want to see and build your page um, from that information. Okay, so when you say one hour of brainstorm, do you mean every day or once per week or how often is that? No, I, w I wouldn't do that every day. I think w once mm. a week is a good good amount of time, a good frequency, I mean. Yeah, and you mentioned that people are often, uh, they uh, don't really want to improve their content or they do the same stuff over and over again. And yeah, that's, it's a really good point because I also get these questions sometimes from people with YouTube channels who want to know how to grow and there, there is not really much luck involved, at, at least at the moment. If your content is good, then in my opinion, 
on almost all topics, all social media, or at least in the programming niche, your accounts will grow on social media if your content is good and you post consistently. So if you are uh, posting consistently and you are still not growing, this probably means your content is bad. So you have to be a, you have to be honest about yourself, uh, and you have to, is, yes. yeah, and you have to ask yourself if people really want to see that stuff, because otherwise there's no reason to subscribe yes. or share. But the thing is, there's also nothing bad about bad content. The most important thing is that you just go out there and share content and approve from that. But if you wait to be ready to share the perfect content, that, that just won't happen. You will improve in that process of making content. And if you start, then you're already ahead of so many people out there. Yeah. So uh, just start and then iterate from there, improve with every post. That's basically the idea. Okay, so we already talked about how you get ideas for posts. You sit down and brainstorm and People also tell you in comments what they want to see. So I think that's it for the Instagram part. For the Instagram part, I think. Or is there anything else you want to add to this? No, I think we got mm -hmm. the most important mm -hmm. points. Yeah. This basically brings me to my next topic, which is many people on social media ask me and they also ask you the same why do you choose to go for the self-employed route why did you choose to create courses which is your main income source right and why did you not take a job at a company as a programmer yeah so i think fundamentally it comes down to two major values you need to decide which one is more important to you and that is freedom versus security if you're employed, then you usually value security more, and that is totally fine. But I found for me that that I really want that freedom more. I want to, to be my own boss. I want to choose what I do each day. When I say, okay, now I want to do Twitch streams and maybe earn something with that, maybe help people with that, then I just want to be able to do that. And that involves a lot of creativity you can have to just to just build your business. And I think if you're employed then there is always someone telling you at least roughly what you should do. And that would give me personally the feeling I, I don't work for my own goals because I work for the goals of my boss. But it is also to totally fine if if being employed is for you working for your own goals. But for me, it's just not the case. Yeah, it's very similar for me. I also feel like um, being self-employed, especially when it's when it's around content where you have much room to do stuff differently, then uh, you just you can design your day basically yourself. You can decide what stuff you do. If you make courses, you can also decide what topics you cover. Although of course you always take viewers and their interests into account, but you just have more options. But it also involves more creativity more risk definitely because definitely. there's it's not said that you even make any money and the risk part also is dependent on your life circumstances so if you were for example became a um, a parent very young then it's yeah. more likely that you will take a job and stay there because you need the security you don't have so much room to make mistakes if you have more mouths to feed than just yourself it depends a bit on life circumstances and your personal risk tolerance. But today, like never before, is basically the best time to be self-employed yeah. with internet and social media around. This was not possible without, uh, or it was possible to be self-employed without internet, but much more difficult. And you were, were really, uh, you only had a few, uh, um, a few uh, niches where this was even possible. Yeah. You also had much less resources where you could learn about building a business yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy to imagine that it's not so long ago that there was no internet at all. <laughs> and yeah. people had, I so, mean, there were, um, is it called bibliotheque in English? I don't actually know. Lib library. library. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> library. <laughs> of course, the library. But there was not so, information, so much information in the library as we have in the internet today. Absolutely. So yeah, it's the best time to go for it. Um, but you don't only create courses, you also do a little bit of freelancing, right? Yes, from time to time. If there is a good offer, I'll take it. And if there are no good offers, I focus on making courses. Yeah, which also fits into the rest because with freelancing, you still have a lot of freedom. You uh, can uh, decide for who you work. They usually don't 
uh, they're not uh, as long as a job hmm. and you still maintain your freedom basically but there are also some downsides to freelancing especially when you live in a in a country like germany or maybe the usa where salaries are higher then it's it's a bit harder to get um, offers that give you the same amount of money than a job would do i think it's always um you always also have to kind of build your brand if you if you're a freelancer that you put out content that you could that, that people somehow know you and somehow know uh, what you know because otherwise why would they spend more money for someone if they can get the same for like someone from a from a poorer country for like five dollars an hour yeah i think that is always if, if you want to do freelancing then you kind of also have that more work kind of that you that you do apart from freelancing that you build your brand put out content and stuff like that and you always have to have to be actively looking for clients if you don't have any uh, other income sources but on the other hand you also have the chance to earn much more money than you can as an employee but also much less money <laughs> yeah this was also actually my uh, next question how to get freelance clients but you already answered that um, you have to market yourself on social media you have to build a brand basically otherwise it's difficult right because no one knows about you yeah and how do they even find you i wouldn't really know how to do it if i wouldn't have some kind of social media presence yeah you have i mean if i know that you have tried upwork right how was yes, your experience with that i like upwork as a platform so i no, i did i didn't make too good experiences with upwork itself and their customer support but upwork is still a good platform to find clients and it, yeah it just helps you to 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 actively do something to find clients because you can just send proposals to uh, potential clients who who describe their their job um i think it's a good place to start but nevertheless you still need to be known or you still need to be have some good testimonials or so if you start there so it's not just like you create an upper account and you will get jobs it, it's really not like that but if you have a good reputation there you can probably make a really good amount of money okay so um yeah people won't really get around creating content basically um, if they want to do uh, if they have want to have some kind of freedom because otherwise yes. you don't get people to you yes i think so or if you're a really good networker for example you go to networking events all the time or hold some speeches then this might also work but this doesn't apply to me for example so i think the the social media route is the better one for me yeah i also have to say i don't want to make a false impression i think having a job is totally fine not everyone has to be self-employed But I think even with a job, it's good if you have some kind of presence either on social media or a blog is also very common to just have a blog where you write some yes. technical content from time to time. Because eventually you might want to switch companies and again, this helps you get people to know you and um, get companies to hire you. To it helps with, you with pretty much anything <laughs> in, yeah. in your career. Yeah, and in this day and age, having some kind of content on the internet is pretty important i think absolutely okay so um, the difference between you and me is that you actually studied computer science in university i studied business economics which which was a big mistake because <laughs> i uh, did not ever use any of this knowledge at all and i mean zero it was a complete waste of time but um, i didn't really know what to do with myself at this time but you were made the right decision you uh, studied computer science or i mean i want to ask you was it the right decision um, are there any uh, bad things about studying computer science do you feel it was worth it and what is your review on this whole thing so first of all i i haven't fully decided yet for myself if it was worth it and this also of course only reflects my experience there are people who probably should study definitely and for whom that's the best thing For me, I'm still uh, struggling if, if that's if, if that was the right decision. One reason why I'm struggling is that you you do learn a lot of stuff you that is literally of, of no significance for your for the practical life of being a software developer is maybe important if you want to go into science, then there is no way around university. But I want to become a programmer. I want to develop software and you need to be aware that it's computer science. You will learn a lot of scientific concepts that you 
can directly apply in practice. And you, you just very often sit there and you don't know why you learn a specific topic and why you don't learn a topic that is much more important. For example, in, in university, I never really learned testing software. And whoever senior developer you ask, they will say testing is such an important skill. And we just wrote unit tests on a piece of paper. So I don't really know why we don't dive deeper into that and maybe do less of the logic theory. I, I don't remember anything of that because I don't use it in my everyday life. So that is what I didn't like about university. What I liked is that it actually, that you can learn having a, having a good structure in your day because nobody tells you what you should do when. And that was a good foundation to actually also dive into self-employment. And that is probably the, the, <laughs> the biggest advantage for me. I just had a lot of time building my brand and building my self-employment. So if I wouldn't have that university time and I w was employed in that time instead, I would obviously have much less time and I could probably not live from that, at least for now. Mm, so it's, yeah, the time while you study, it gives you a little bit of freedom if you are smart with how you are, how you use yes, your time. You definitely have time next to university. If not, but, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that it's very theoretical, right? And not much practical knowledge. It's very theoretical, yes. So yeah, we, we wrote one software project in, in my whole oh, my whole university. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's basically the the complete opposite to uh, what we try to do when we, uh, I don't know, when we try to get employed, right? We try to put real projects on GitHub and real and show that we can do real stuff. Although having a degree probably still helps with getting employed if this is your goal, because yeah, it's a piece of paper that says that you know about computer science. Yeah, I think it helps, but I also think that it's not necessary at least, at least today. Maybe that was the case 15 years ago and your parents tell you that, but I don't think nowadays you have to have it. It helps, but you can also prove what you know with other ways. Yeah, I think it also depends on the country. I actually don't know how it is in Germany. I could imagine that in Germany, they are a bit more old school when it comes to that and want to see a degree, mm. but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, and you mentioned parents. This is often the biggest part of this decision to go to university because your parents think that this is the best. It's a bit there are, there are generations that come together that, that are so different times have really changed and yes. often the stuff that your parents told you is not timely anymore. This is really a problem because yes. you don't really know how to decide. But in, yeah, I, I would say uh, if you're young and computer science interests you, then I would probably also study it if I uh, was the, at that age again. And it's my interest, uh, even just for um, getting a bit deeper into this topic and just mm. for the, uh, enjoying it and having this degree, I would probably still decide to uh, study uh, computer science. Yeah, it definitely also helps to just get a good general understanding of, of computers. So, of course, in computer science, you, you learn a lot about computers and tech in general, and not only programming. And that often helps you with programming because you, you can easier connect different topics, I think. Yeah, that's an argument I often hear, actually, that the that it's called computer science for a reason and not programming mm. because you are not apparently you're not actually really supposed to learn real programming no. there you're but that is what most people think they will mm. only learn yeah that's it, i would say it's about one third is about programming concepts hmm. yeah but i uh, assume that learning computer science is also interesting although yeah. probably not as much fun as writing actual code yeah, i think it's also very very dependent on who you are there are a lot of people who who just enjoy studying, and especially you can also you can also find other people who do the same thing as you, and that is also valuable. A lot of people find friends for life when studying. Yeah. Um, I found them in school, but not in university. But I hear that very often, and that is also quite an important thing. Yeah, and you learn some social skills. Yes. When you have to um, go uh, get along with other people your age. And of course, this is now also specific to my university. I can't speak for any other mm. universities because I haven't been there, obviously. Yeah. So um, one other thing I often see popping up in uh, 
for example, when I ask if people have questions for you for this podcast, they often want to know about DSA, data structures and algorithms. And I know that you made a post about this. For me, these are just words. Um, I, I, I mean, I know what data structures and algorithms are, but I don't know why there is this big focus on this particular topic. Do you think it's impor important to focus on learning them? The, the thing why there is a, such a big focus is because universities stress a lot about them. Okay, I get you, it. You have a whole subject about data structures and algorithms. So a whole semester, you're only dealing with lists, hash maps, trees, uh, graphs, and sorting algorithms and whatever is out there. Uh, um, so if, let me, let me say it that way, if you want to become a programmer and you want to develop applications, you're most likely not going to need it, at least not in as much as university teaches it. So you will never really need to write a sorting algorithm from scratch. Every, every programming language out there has an implemented version of that that works the best. You, in terms of data structures, you need lists, hash maps, maybe queues, maybe stacks, but that's pretty much it. I've never needed to work with any trees or graphs in my everyday life. So I think it's a good way to actually improve your programming logic because it's just pure logical thinking. And that's also why it's so popular in interviews. So if you have a coding interview, you probably need to learn that. But in the actual practical world, you don't really need it that much. And I have talked to some much more experienced developers than I, than I am, and they also say that. Yeah, for me, uh, I also learned this stuff only when I need it, basically, when I encounter it in code. So I probably have large knowledge gaps when it comes to that, because a lot of the stuff I haven't needed yet. But you can still build apps. Right. And, but I haven't done a job interview ever. So maybe I would fail there because I don't know how to work with them. Um, actually, Upwork contacted me that they um, invited me for such a special interview. Oh, so I get a badge on my profile and that is a data structure algorithm interview. <laughs> I really don't want to do it, but I, I will try it, but I won't really practice for that. And would this see. be like, like a Zoom interview or how does this work? Uh, it's it uses a website called Code Signal. It's Maybe basically it's online automated. coding. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I need to make a coding challenge, but I need to record my screen and my webcam so they see that I don't cheat. Okay. And then they get that and manually review that. And this is basically invitation only. So I think having this batch is good, especially because if I pass that, I can do an Android test. And I would rather have that Android batch instead yeah. of the data structure batch. But I need to pass both, I think. But I'll try it. And if, it, if I fail, then I don't really care. Yeah, I can imagine that having such a badge on your profile helps with clients there. Um, yeah, I'm interested to I'm interested to uh, see how uh, Upwork goes for you in the future. I will um, observe this a little bit. Maybe I'll try it out as well. Yeah, and people by now have noticed that you really uh, do uh, a lot. You uh, you just finished your degree, right? So this is over yes. now. But up until recently, while you were building your Instagram page, you were studying on the side and you also did yes. YouTube at the same time. So what many people, including me, want to know, how the hell are you so productive? How do you manage your time that you get so much done? Because for me, it's difficult. Yeah, I think this is not just something you be. That is something you need to develop. You have to have the goal of actually wanting to become more productive. And if you have something that is truly important to you, for me, it was like just being able to to live from what I do without being employed. Then that is already that drive you need to to have the foundation for that. the The second thing is um, that that made the biggest impact for me was just not wasting time. It sounds so easy, but let, let's define what wasting time actually means for me or whether what not wasting time means for me time is not wasted if you either fully enjoy the moment or if you work on something that's important for your future and that that helps you for, to achieve your goals if you do something that doesn't fit into these two things for example scrolling through instagram you can say okay you enjoy the moment but i i don't think most people really live in the moment when they scroll through instagram so that is that doesn't have any impact on your future and you, you just do it to distract yourself. And these things, I just stopped doing them. 
I, I stopped watching any series on, uh, I don't have Netflix or stuff like that. I never watch any movies just because it's not important to me. If it's important to you, that's of course fine, but you have to dis discover what really matters to you. And if you really want to do something, if you want to live, um, if you want to make a living self-employed, then you just have to, you have to put in the work and then this must be your number one priority for some time. Otherwise, it's it's just not going to work. Hmm. How much do you sleep per night? I sleep around seven and a half hours at the moment. Okay. Um, do you sleep with an alarm or without one? Yes, for a long time I, I slept without alarm and then I tried sleeping with an alarm. It's it's much harder for me actually to get out of bed, but when I'm out of bed, I'm I'm fully active and awake. So that's that's kind of a, a good deal for me. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, you mentioned that you don't watch any shows or movies. One interesting strategy I heard somewhere else is uh, that you can also just watch movies and shows when you socialize with friends because then you have yeah. two things at the same time basically that you cover but i agree that if you sit home alone and watch shows it's it's fun but it really feels like it can swallow so yeah. much time i think uh, yeah i mean i also sometimes watch like entertainment videos on youtube and i enjoy that i usually take that as kind of a reward or just to calm down in the evening when i did some work um but i think a lot of people get lost in that and just watch one movie after the other. And I think then they rather have an issue with um, with finding what they what they really want. They rather want to distract themselves from from facing the actual problems in their life. That is what I think. Yeah, being bored sometimes can be helpful to uh, really yeah. figure out what you want to do. The same is the case for when you are around too many people, in my opinion. It can really... Uh, It can distract you so much that you don't know what you actually want to do, what is important to you, what you maybe don't like so much, but you uh, kept ignoring it in the past. So I think being alone and being bored sometimes can be really uh, helpful. Um, and I also think, by the way, that watching movies is uh, still... Uh, the better choice than watching a show because movies are like 90 minutes, two hours long and shows can be, I don't know, 20, 40 hours and shows can be really addictive. Yeah. And the last show I watched was Mr. Robot, which was great, but it, it's so addictive, especially when there are cliffhangers in each episode. Yeah. And then you immediately want, want to watch the next one and you can easily waste so much time doing it. Of course, if you really enjoy it, doesn't mean you have to... Uh, stop it completely and maybe uh, um, limit it to a few uh, or to a few days per week or something like that and it, i also think you yeah, you it can also actually keeps it more fun yes. yeah you can, i th also think you can actually um take have the approach to to learn something with whatever you do if you watch a movie then you can always learn something from that you can you can check how is the story built and you can learn something about storytelling which is of course a very important skill That you can also use in your maybe if you have a business also so just having the approach to whatever you do just checking how, how other people do things that can help you move forward i think yeah this is why i really love um watching or listening to podcasts while i eat i, I love yeah. listening or uh, watching video podcasts while i eat usually with topics that are not programming related but uh, all kinds of stuff like philosophy uh, um other technical stuff or politics or just art or i don't know but it's a good way to uh, have some kind of entertainment because these podcasts are usually interesting but at the same time learn something from it and in my opinion this is always just a better use of your time now i don't want to promote toxic productivity because i know some no. people hate people who always want to be productive but this doesn't mean that you can't use some little tricks here and there to uh, make make your life a bit more productive and use your time better and then you also have more off time where as you already said you can shut down completely and just relax yes. 100 so i think there's nothing wrong with trying to use your time efficiently absolutely no <laughs> if your goal is not to be more productive then that's fine but yes. then that i don't think that's the goal of most people yeah so this is how you are so productive and Of course, as programmers, especially in Android, we have to uh, 
keep up with the fast changes. We have to uh, learn a lot of new stuff. My question is, how do you learn new programming concepts? Maybe what sources do you use yourself? Because people often ask me where I learn my, my programming knowledge from as if there was this one special source where everything is written down and only YouTubers have the source because yeah. <laughs> other people <laughs> other people can't find it. Um, it's secret. Yeah, so you what do you... <laughs> Only YouTubers have it, and we yes. have to distribute it to the <laughs> to the community. No, but um, how do you learn new stuff? How do you approach learning a new topic? And how do you keep up with the fast changes? For me, it helps making courses because with with every new course that I make, I I learn a new topic. So I don't usually make at least the the paid courses. I don't make these about topics that I already fully know. Instead, for example, I want to make my next project about um, a multi-module project, multi-module architecture. And that, that was something I never dealt that much um, with. So I now learned that, build a project for myself with that. Then I have learned that topic so I can build a course or another project with that. And just having having the, um, the, the drive to, to learn something new with every single course helps me. So now not everybody creates courses. I think you should just take yourself fixed times each week, maybe an hour a day or just once a week for multiple hours and just dive into one topic you actually want to learn. I think that is really everything you can say to that. Yeah, I think learning by teaching is the best way to learn. I think it's even it's even proven scientifically that this is the best way to learn yes. because this way you realize where you have knowledge gaps. Because if you were explain something, you have to uh, create a chain of thought that makes sense from beginning to end. If you just apply knowledge, then you can ignore certain stuff and brush it under the rug, basically. But for teaching, you, yeah. If you, if you can't explain something in simple terms, then you haven't fully understood it. Yeah, that's true. I think it's, it's like with a song. If you think you know a song, that because you have it in your head that doesn't mean you could you could sing it by yourself like from the beginning to the end and i think that's the same as you think you understood a concept versus actually explaining a concept maybe you just memorize the steps like a recipe then you don't understand yeah. the topic which also yeah the thing is people think that on android stuff is deprecating so super fast and i often make fun about it but i actually think that it's not really deprecating that fast. No. First of all, st even stuff like async task was around for years and no one had a problem with using it. So it's not like this was there and then a, mo a week later it was deprecated already. And also we just talked about um, understanding stuff instead of memorizing it, which is important. And this often makes it easy to uh, switch from run library to another one which works by the same concept. So for example, I personally, I haven't used RxJava because this was almost before I started programming. When I started Android, um, not much later, there was already live data around, which had a similar purpose. But as far as I know, RxJava and the new Kotlin flow are pretty similar in their functionality. Yeah. They are reactive data sources, right? Yes. And I think live data was a little bit of a light version of that. It had some special functionality with the Android lifecycle, but it was also similar. And even some operators that you can use on these on these variables, on these types are similar between live data, flow and RxJava. And the point I want to make is that if you learned RxJava and you understood how it works instead of just memorizing where you have to put what then usually switching to Kotlin flow and considering RxJava may be deprecated or not timely anymore should not be a big problem. And it's the same for a lot of other stuff. Even, even switching from Java to Kotlin was, in my opinion, relatively easy. You yeah. need a week at most to, to learn the stuff you need to know. And of course, there are some details like special language functionalities, but you can learn them while you are applying them, basically. I think a lot of people actually don't even think about looking stuff up in the internet. So they just see that uh, deprecated strike through 
and they they go to their favorite Instagrammer and send him a message. Hey, this is deprecated. What should I do? And they just need to type that in Google. And very often, if you just type in X Y Z is deprecated replacement, and the first result you get is literally just another function you can use. <laughs> It's so easy so often. I actually had it noted down as a later question what people are doing wrong when they ask a question and this sums it up pretty well. They are lazy, they don't Google. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the whole point. Um, Google should always be the first place you're searching new information from because this is what Google was made for and you find most of the stuff. Um, of course, we create tutorials, but the point of our tutorials is that we are We prepare the knowledge in a more concise form so people don't have to spend all this time searching on Google. But this doesn't mean that you have to wait until we have a tutorial on a particular topic out. You yes. can find all this. This is what we basically do. We just Google this stuff. We yeah. spend a lot of time to bring it in this nice video form where it's short and concise and easier to consume. But you should definitely uh, be able to uh, find solutions yourself in Google. People often also search for something super specific or request you to make a tutorial about something super yeah, I get specific this a lot like as well. hey please make a tutorial about sql migration for a job board app yes <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you're like okay learn sql migration understand that and you will be able to apply that for any type of project <laughs> yeah you, you i think people want to find a shortcut that's the problem you have to uh, you have to understand that there is no real shortcut in learning it will be difficult to uh, learn a new concept, no matter if a YouTuber explains it to you or if you search it up yourself in Google. Just someone preparing the knowledge for you doesn't mean that you don't have to go through the process of applying and understanding it yourself. So it will always you will always need effort to learn new programming concepts. Of course, this makes it difficult to stay motivated over the long term because programming is is difficult and being motivated to learn new stuff or to create content for social media for a few weeks is pretty easy while you are motivated or when you are a programmer beginner then you probably spend hours on end because it's exciting but eventually pretty much everything gets at least a little bit more boring and you also have some dips in your motivation. So my question is to you, Philip, do you have any special tips on how to uh, stay consistent in whatever you do and maybe how to stay motivated? Yeah, I think it again comes down to having something that you that, that matters to you and your future and that you enjoy. The enjoyment can leave for, for, for an amount of time, but if in most cases it will come back. So Maybe there are cases where it fully leaves and then you need to find something else. But at least for me, it's the case that I fully enjoy programming. I don't enjoy it every single day, but most days. And on these days where I don't enjoy it, I still have that, that goal in mind where I actually want to go. I want to keep building my business. I want to get better as a programmer. And on days where I, where I don't enjoy that, I still think, okay, this is what I'm doing this for. And I think having this combination of enjoying something most of the time and actually doing something that matters to you and your future, that is uh, really helpful. And it also, of course, comes down to habits, just doing something every day. That is also a very common question I get is uh, how people yeah, just, just stay motivated. And there, there is no secret hack to stay motivated. Oftentimes, when you're not motivated, you just have to do it. And if you do that over and over again, it, it becomes a habit and... It won't be as hard as it used to be to to still do it, even though if you want don't want to do it in a moment. Yeah, I agree that it's important that you at least some of the time have fun doing it. I think there are people for who programming just is not the right thing. If your parents talked you into it and you really hate it, then it's probably better to uh, just learn something different. I also started learning programming at almost 27, so I started pretty late with it. And... Even now, if I would hate programming and it was not fun for me at all, now at 31, I would still switch to something else because you have so many years ahead of you. Yeah. There's like no point in doing more something More than half you of your life. Yes. And medicine is always improving. Uh, who knows how long we live? Maybe we yeah. all become 150. 
but of, of course you can always learn something new yeah so fun is important but a little bit of discipline and habits is also important there's a nice book about this topic the power of habit by charles duhick which explains this there are also other to uh, books that cover the same topic but i think this was the original which kicked off all this habit stuff and the focus on habits and yeah habit basically removes the willpower out of things if you make something a habit then you do it without thinking about it all the time and it becomes easier now there's one downside of habits which is that it also makes time feel like it goes by faster if you have a lot of habits because your brain doesn't remember the same stuff happening over and over again it basically conflates all of this to uh, it conflates like uh, 300 days into one day because it always happened the same so this is a bit of a downside that it feels like the the time is passing faster but but is that really a bad thing i mean yeah for something you it, consider work probably not then it's probably a good thing that it that it i mean if time flies by fast then it's usually a sign that you really enjoy what you're doing yes i mean or if, or or also if it's just work and you don't enjoy it but you made it a habit so your brain doesn't really remember it but a good way to counter this is just to have some new experiences in your life from time to time just do something special on the weekends and then time yes. seems to uh, go by slower again because i'm also a big, yeah. big fan of having these these fixed quality times just yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in my world, don't waste your time with uh, watching 10 shows a day. Instead, spend your day working towards your goals, but then also have some off time where you do some something that is really special to you. And as far as I know, you take a whole day off per week, right? Yeah, I'd, I must say I don't have that fixed day, but I take a day off when I when I feel I need it. And that's usually on a one week basis, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're employed, then you usually have the weekends free. But the way I approach this as a self-employed is that if I'm at home and I don't have anything important to do, then I try to work and be productive. But then if a friend calls me and says, hey, do you want to go out tomorrow morning to this, this and this, then I immediately do it. Then I don't work on this yeah. uh, these hours on the day. And this is the freedom I get from this. Exactly. That's also what I like so much. Do you have any general tips on how to stay focused when you're working on something or when you're studying? I know that you are a fan of putting your phone away. <laughs> that is what I just wanted to say. I'm a big fan of that. Um, because I, I noticed that even, even though I know that having your phone next to you um, is a big distraction, you shouldn't touch it. If it lies there, you will touch it much more often than you would if it lies somewhere else. And I know some Android developers will come and say, hey, I need my phone to, to test my Android apps. How should I do it? Well, the best case is that your PC is good enough to run the emulator. That is what I do. If not, then at least, I think for, for most phones, you can set up a separate profile where you don't get any notifications or so. You can turn on airplane mode or whatever. I think that really helps if you need it for your job. But I just uh, put it back there on my table and then yeah i work with the pomodoro technique so i work in 50 minute blocks and then i have a 10 minute break and in this in this 10 minute break i allow myself of uh, to look through instagram and that really helps me because i'm also pretty addicted to scrolling through instagram like probably most of us and i just need to do that regularly but that was a way to actually still have focused work and also have that kind of reward for that focused work to to scroll through Instagram. So I I guess when you post stories on Instagram, then you do this in your breaks. You don't do this in the middle of work. Or do you sometimes just pull your phone out and then... Sometimes I, I just do it. If it. I mean, posting stories is kind of related to my work. Yeah. Um, but it, I don't post that many stories when I'm working. But if I have something funny that I want to share, then I just take my phone, post the story, but immediately put it away. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem for me because I also like doing that when uh, there is something in my code I want to make a story about or something yeah. funnier. Then I do it immediately. But the problem with Instagram is that they, uh, if you start the app and you had it not opened for a while, it always brings you back to the feed. I think yeah. they do this on purpose to get you back into the feed, even if you were on a completely different screen. This is a bit annoying because you can basically not 
post a story without triggering a reload of your feed. And yeah. I mean, you can, of course, just ignore it. But my problem with this is that I have a little bit of fear of missing out if my feed reloads and I just put it away because I, I know that the posts I don't look at will disappear later unless I scroll far enough. So if, for example, I post a story and your post pops up, then I usually go ahead and read it because otherwise I'm a bit too scared that I miss it. <laughs> of course, you it's can, not a big deal. You can also deal. just hit the, the, the save icon and yeah. scroll through it later. Yeah, that's probably something I should get used to, just using the save. Oh, this is a tip here. Just use the save icon, hmm. uh, save Philip's post, and then read them later. Don't read yes. them immediately. Yeah. And you also mentioned putting your phone maybe on airplane. Actually, I think... Do not disturb mode is better because this way internet still works. Yeah, yeah true. And in do not disturb mode, you can add numbers that can still call you because calls are also uh, interrupted in this time. But also, but uh, for example, I have the most important people set as exceptions in DND mode so they can still reach me. This is a good way to uh, stay away from notifications and this stuff while you're working without turning your phone off or putting it away even. Okay, so I think we already talked a little bit about sleep earlier. You said you sleep seven and a, and a half hours round about. I think I sleep about the same time. Um, but it depends because I sleep without an alarm. So sometimes I sleep longer. Sometimes I even sleep only six hours. But we both do uh, sports on most weeks of the day. And I notice in comparison to when I take a break from sports, for example, when I'm sick, that I need more sleep, quite a bit of more sleep when I exercise than without. Without, when I was sick, I actually woke up every day after like six hours of sleep, but I need much more when I exercise. Nevertheless, we both have the opinion that exercise is important, even as even as a programmer, right? Even though the, the, the typical image of a programmer is someone who just sits in front of the PC all day, but this will also make you less productive and it will just cause problems down the road yeah i think it really also helps you to focus because i think in most cases having a healthy body also leads to ha having a healthy mind yes. so i i really that that's also a good way to just to have that fixed time off so that i know okay i have these two hours every day where i just where i'm just for myself i i work out i care for my body because of course if if i have a rest day and i don't do any sports then I get more stuff done. I just have more time. But I don't think if I would do that on every day, so if I would completely stop working out, then I would have more time, but I wouldn't use that time as good as I can use it now. And I think that is really what sports and uh, eating healthy does. Yeah, and it also keeps your mind... Have, you already mentioned that, but it also avoids stuff like depression often. If you're out of shape yes. and you eat like trash, then... Uh, it's easier to uh, get into bad cognitive states, get into depression yes, and this stuff. Best therapy. Yes. And finally, I get often my best ideas at the end of the gym, exercise mm -hmm. after gym workout. It's funny because it's always at the end. I work out like, like 90 minutes and then suddenly, boom, I get a solution for a problem or something like that. It happens so often. It's so funny. But it's important that you take your mind really off a problem from time to time. And because you're, it's not your consciousness that actually solves problems. It's not this thinking about something. Actually, the, the, the part of the mind that really solves problems is the subconscious part. So when you don't think actively about something, then you really solve problems and but come up with new connections. That's also why so often you wake up and you suddenly have a solution yeah, the, to your problem. Yeah, the same happens in sleep, you, right? Your, your mind was working all night to solve that. Yeah, and... Um, Exercising is also a good way to get out of the house, sometimes to get around people, especially when you work from home. I'm actually I'm actually shocked that so many people in, in my age already have back problems and neck problems. And I think exercise is the best way to prevent that. Yeah, I can only say that my sitting posture is often bad, but I still never had any back problems, probably because I exercise yeah, and too. I do deadlifts and all that stuff. Yes. And even though I sometimes sit like a like a troll with a rounded <laughs> back. I never had any problems. Yeah, mm. same. <laughs> so yeah, you should do some form of exercise. I mean, you don't have to become a meathead in the gym. You can just, I don't know, what I started recently, as you already know, is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a 
awesome, great form of doing exercise. It's so much fun. And I think if you don't want to go to the gym, you want to do something more fun than something like this. A martial art, for example, can be a nice way to get exercise in. Just moving. Yeah. If it's, if it's tennis, table tennis, whatever, whatever you enjoy, it's fine. As it's, long as you use your body for what it's intended to be used. Yeah. And it's such an intense kind of, I don't, I mean, I don't want to advertise Brazilian Jiu Jitsu here, but it's such a great kind of workout because it's fun and the time flies and you sweat so much because it's so intense, but it's, it's, it's great. It's not boring at all. I can understand that gym is boring for many people because you do one rep, two rep, three. I, I love it actually. I really enjoy weightlifting, but I understand that many people don't really like that. But yeah, find some kind of exercise. Otherwise you will regret it later. And also just looking better is a good reason in itself already. Okay. That's it for the health part. I think we talked about sports, sleep, nutrition, of course, is also important. Yes. Both for staying in shape, but also for mental abilities. What you eat has a lot of effect on how clear you can think. Doesn't mean you have to eat boring stuff all the time. You can still enjoy food, but I don't know. You should probably not eat pizza and sweets all day. Then you will not function properly. But if you For learn nothing. to, yeah. But if you learn to cook a little bit, then you can actually make amazing, nice tasting food and still eat healthy. And the more often you actually eat healthy, the less you want all these cheats. That's at least the case for me. Yeah, Sometimes that's, that's I do true. want to have a pizza, but it, compared to um, to when I was a teenager or so, it's much much more rare. Yeah, that's it's it's really good point because I feel like taste buds or your brain adapts to how intense the stuff tastes you eat. So, for example, if you are used to eating sweets and ice cream all day then something like an apple tastes super boring because it just can't compete with the intenseness of the sweetness. But if you uh, don't eat sweets all day and you eat vegetables and other stuff like potatoes, I don't know, then something like an apple becomes super delicious again because it uh, the, the sweetness is relative to the stuff you usually eat, very uh, intense. So I think your brain somehow gets used to the stuff I eat. I remember I had a time in my early 20s where I eat only trash. I eat pizza and sweets and drank cola all day. Um, needless to say that I was completely out of shape at this time. But if, at a certain point, even the pizza stops tasting delicious if you eat it all the time, because you just adapt to this stuff. So if you eat healthy and make fast food just something you eat from time to time, then it will also taste much better again. This is an definitely an observ observation I made as well. Yes, me too. Okay, that's it for the nutrition part. Don't underestimate this. It's really important. Okay, we are almost done. Of course, what people also want to know is what do you think about Jetpack Compose? So we are back at Android now. Jetpack Compose, the newer declarative UI framework on Android. Uh, first of all, what do you think about this? Do you think it's the future? And also what people really want to know is, is XML still relevant or is all the XML knowledge now immediately uh, pointless, useless? So yeah, I've used Jetpack Compose now in multiple projects and I enjoy it much more than building apps with XML because you just have much more freedom. You just simple things like giving giving some views a border is just so much more easy now you don't need to create any drawable resources or whatever um so that is definitely a big fun factor that that improved in terms of is it the future i also think so because if we take a look at other technologies at, at web development ios development they all use the same approach that Big compose uses and there must be a reason for that if all these popular technologies use that I think it will take time though. So of course it's very new, it, it just got stable. And until companies actually adapt to that, um, it takes time. They can't just press a big red button and switch their code base from XML to Jetpack Compose. It just won't happen because 
there's always that trade-off for companies. It's spending money for changing code and improving it or spending money to implement more features for their app that actually the users have something from that brings them direct money. And I think, yeah, it will be the future, but it will take time. And if I make a new app nowadays, I will probably use Jetpack Compose for that. Yeah, my little hobby project I started recently, I also made in Compose and I really enjoy it. Once you get the hang of it and understand how state is managed and stuff like that, but it's it's kind of addictive to write layouts like this. Of course, some stuff is more more difficult than with the old constraint layout where you could just drag and drop um, yeah. the views into place. Um, but it's still fun. It makes bugs much less common in my opinion because with XML you had you had to manage the state of these views yourself and you often had two sources of truth, the state that's internal to the viewer, like a checkbox, and the the state you have in your view model, for example, for the checkbox. But in Compose, it's different. If the you have to pass a value if the checkbox is checked or not. And if you don't pass this value, then clicking it won't make anything happen. And this way you have a single source of truth. You know that if the checkbox is checked, then the corresponding Boolean value that feeds this checkbox which probably comes from your view model, also has the same value. So you have one single source of truth, which makes bugs less common. Um, one thing about, I also agree that it will take time before XML is is completely gone because there's so much legacy code now with XML in yeah. it. Um, but you also have to keep in mind that, you, that they are interoperable. You can use composables in normal XML views and the other way around as well. So even companies who are, have a ton of XML code will probably start using Jetpack Compose pretty yeah. much immediately. Most of them for newer, for newer uh, screens, for example, just to start getting into it. But well, there's still some things that Jetpack Compose doesn't offer yet that are very easy with XML. For example, diff util animations. Yeah, or overshoot scrolling animations is also not there yet, mm, like in Recycler yeah. Viewer. Or shared element transitions. But no question, they will start uh, adding this that stuff. That would come, definitely, soon. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, as said, I uh, enjoy JPEG Compose as well. It takes a bit of time to uh, wrap your head around it when you start a good source <clears throat> to get started. You have a tutorial series about it, right? Mm, yes. So people can check this out. I will put this into uh, the show notes. And similar to Jetpack Compose is Flutter, right? I haven't tried out Flutter myself ever. I just completely ignored it because I felt like I already needed enough time learning Android itself. Have you tried out Flutter? And if yes, do you like it? Do you think it's a real competition for native Android development? Or does it even replace it? I have tried it out, not much. I made one note app with it. And... but. Talking about Flutter, I really like it because you just have one code base. You you have an iOS and an Android app. Of course, that's a huge advantage compared to just native development. The thing I don't like about Flutter is the language it uses, which is Dart. Um, it's not fun. It reminds me of Java all the time because it's so similar. And if you're used to writing Kotlin code, then you won't enjoy Dart because it's it's just less beautiful. In Kotlin, you have so many cool things and syntactical sugar which you don't have in Dart. Um, so if you like Dart, then I think Flutter is a very great option to make apps. Of course, there are limitations and things native is better at, which is like uh, where if you do stuff close to hardware, using sensors, media playback, all that stuff, um, Flutter can do that natively. So for Flutter, you need kind of plugins and these plugins need to be written in native language. So there's always native language somehow involved. And you should also have a rough understanding of native if you use Flutter. But overall, for I think for most apps, Flutter is also a good option, especially if an app is only dealing with data. So you have a database and a, an API, which is very often the case and not more than that. Then Flutter apps can can surely do that. But I'm, I'm still more a fan of native development and maybe also KMM if it comes out. Yeah, um, I agree that not using Kotlin on Flutter is a bit of a turn off. But yeah, we have Kotlin multi-platform now. Yeah. And by the way, what does KMM stand for? Because it doesn't stand for Kotlin multi-platform. Kotlin multi-platform mobile. Ah, okay. 
So the idea is to uh, share code between uh, iOS and Android mm -hmm. and have apps for both and have some shared code. Have you played around with KMM yet? <laughs> I've, I've tried it once. So the thing is, if you actually also want to make the iOS app, then you need a Mac for that because you need to write the iOS UI in Swift and the rest of the code is shared. So business logic, data layer, Android UI is all written in Kotlin and the iOS UI in Swift. Um, because I don't have a Mac yet, I can't fully explore KMM, but I have tried around with it a bit. I created a project and just checked how that looks like. I didn't finish it. Um, I think right now it's, uh, when I tried that, it was Android Studio Canary version. So right now it was a pain to get the versions right because you have iOS dependencies, Android dependencies, and Android Studio Canary destroyed a lot. So I think that's now better with the stable version. Most dependency issues were with Compose and Compose beta versions. Apart from that, I think it's a really, really fun way to make apps in future. And that will actually be, if we talk about the, the cross-platform and multi-platform frameworks, that will be the one that I think I will enjoy the most in future and that I will dive into. So my plan is to, to get a MacBook at the start of next year, probably. And then I also plan to make some tutorials about that because it's also a good skill to have if you're freelancing to just be able to make an app for iOS and Android together. So um, with KMM around, it means that native Android development will probably not use much popularity to Flutter because it's a way to, uh, it's still native, right? Because we have this platform specific code. Yes. And we just share other parts of code that are the same for both clients. And I think for me, this seems like a more interesting approach than uh, these complete cross platform yeah. frameworks that do everything. Because as you said, the, you get problems as soon as you try to do platform specific stuff and then you depend on these plugins. So yeah. I think learning native Android right now with the option to uh, go into a Kotlin multi-platform later seems to be the most interesting and most attractive approach right now. I think for native developers, that is the case. Um, a lot of people also ask me that. I also recently made a Q&A on YouTube where I also had that question if, if native development will die or so, and I don't think so. I mean, sure, it might be the case that cross-platform will have a wider audience of, of developers, but that doesn't mean native dies. There will always be a place for native and especially for these um, special use cases. I talked about like uh, media playback and all that stuff. There will be companies and clients who need exactly such an app. And if you are someone who can say, hey, I really know native development and I am specialized on these things, then you are one among very few. And that means you can charge more. And yeah, that's uh, that's better if you are in a, in a huge market of of uh, developers who do uh, cross-platform, in my opinion, just being specialized. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Even if native Android development would lose popularity, which I don't think even then it's good to be that specialized person that knows how to do this if a company needs someone. And also, if you, we already talked about that, if you really understand something, then it's easy for you to also adapt to other technologies. Right. So I think if I would now get into Flutter and if I would really want to learn it, then that would be a matter of one to two months until I can build some more solid apps with that. Yeah, and Flutter has been around for a while now and I never felt like native was losing popularity because of that. It's just not the image I get when I look through the communities. Yeah, and there I know also that, yeah. A, a lot of popular native Android developers who are hating quite yeah, a lot I was about Flutter, to say like the Jake same. Warden. I was about to say exactly the same. Jack Wharton really uh, hates Flutter. <laughs> he uh, has a lot of uh, aggressive comments about it. I don't know how correct they are, but considering that he's Jack Wharton, I... Uh, he's uh, working he's, in the native Android yeah, developer team. He knows a lot of stuff. So, uh, um, so yeah, the bottom line is that if you were, are interested in Flutter, by all means, go ahead, try it out. And it's probably a good choice for simple apps that you just quickly want to uh, develop for both platforms. And you don't need a Mac for Flutter, right? You can... No. You know, this is one good point because Macs are expensive, as we know. I mean, technically, you also don't need a Mac for KMM, but if you don't have one, you can only make the Android app, but it will still be a fully working Android app. Okay. But, but what I want to say is if you, uh, the viewer is interested more in native Android development and you want to get a job, then you don't have to be scared that Flutter no. will take this away from you. Not I in think, the next uh, five years, at least. 
Yeah, okay. So this was basically uh, all my questions. Um, was a good timing. My last question is, where can people find out more about you and where can they buy your courses? I think a good place to start is actually checking my YouTube channel. If you're an Android developer, you will like it. I will share regular Android content every third day. So I think you will put a link down below in the show notes or so. Yes. And if you end up liking what I post there, then I do have more advanced courses on my website, pl-coding.com. And these just, yeah, they, they help you to dive deeper into these Android concepts and especially build some solid projects. If you do that, I'm very thankful for the support and you will also not regret it. But first of all, check check my free videos and see if you like it. Okay, so yeah, I will, po I will put all the important links into the show notes. So uh, yeah, thank you for coming up in the show and um, making uh, my first ever podcast <laughs> so easy for me. <laughs> thank yeah, you for that. Th thanks for having me.